Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Welcome to MIT Faculty Forum Online. I'm David Rotman, Editor-at-Large at MIT Technology Review, and I will moderate today's webcast. Today's broadcast is sponsored in part by MIT Federal Credit Union, MIT Professional Education, and MIT Sloan Executive Education. As a reminder, we welcome your questions during this chat. Alumni joining us via Zoom can use the Q&A feature found on your toolbar. Please use the Q&A feature and it will make the questions pop up and, and much easier. We'll get to as many questions as we can. Today, we're talking with Robert Schiller, who holds a master's and a PhD from MIT in class years 1968 and 1972. Schiller is Sterling Professor of Economics at the Yale School of Management, the 2013 Nobel Laureate in Economic Sciences, and author of the new book, Narrative Economics, How Stories Go Viral and Drive Major Economic Events. A link to his full bio can be found in the chat window. Please welcome Professor Schiller, who will begin by giving us an overview of his book and his insights on the American economy this spring. Professor Schiller. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, so uh, I, I wrote a book, uh, came out in October, <clears throat> about e uh, basic principles of economics uh, and uh, tying it into epidemiology as well as other di disciplines. I had a view of the economy as being buffeted by a string of epidemics of various sorts, but usually not of the disease sort. I'm thinking of narrative epidemics, where ideas that are embodied by stories are contagious and travel from person to person, and have some of the same dynamics that we see in viral uh, disease epidemics. Uh, and uh, so, uh, the idea of, uh, of contagion as something to be modeled uh, uh, by economists uh, is, is somehow uh, not, very, not very well developed. That's why I wrote this book. It, it, it seemed like we were the social science with the least attention to a very important phenomenon, contagion. Uh, and uh, uh, after my book came out, uh, everyone in, all over the world is talking about epidemic models now. Uh, but it wasn't that way when I started. So this is just a, uh, showing how important narratives are uh, in various disciplines. I should step back a moment. We think of economics as something that's in textbooks and on uh, class lectures with equations and diagrams, but that's not the way the public thinks about economics. Ideas about economics are in much more primitive form for wide distribution. And they typically take the form of stories. Somebody, uh, somebody did something uh, and it's illustrative of some economic principle. Uh, that's a narrative. Uh, and the, the idea that narratives are important in human thinking, that contagious narratives multiply and spread through a population uh, is an important idea in anthropology, sociology, history, uh, and psychology, but not so important in economics. You can see it here both for all years uh, in the JSTOR database of academic journals or the, for the recent decade. And you can see that economics and finance are the least interested in narrative uh, of all these fields. Although they're getting more interested, everybody is getting more interested in narratives. And I think that reflects both uh, improvement of our understanding of human behavior and also uh, improved databases. We now have digitized text uh, for all, of all sorts that we can, um, we can uh, search and find uh, people's, uh, we can't get directly into people's minds, but we can find out what stories they were telling. Uh, so that's, uh, so this is an effort to uh, be more cosmopolitan in our approach to understanding basic economic thinking. So uh, this relates to markets and the prices of markets. 
shown here is a slide that I, I had in my 2013 Nobel lecture in Stockholm. Uh, so I haven't updated it. It's the same diagram. Uh, but it shows the, the blue line is the stock price in real terms corrected for inflation for the United States from 1871 until then it was 2013. Uh, and also shown on the diagram are present values of subsequent dividends, which by economic theory, the stock price should be, uh, at least by some theories, uh, that the, the stock price is a prediction of the present value of subsequent dividends. Uh, uh, and so uh, what is it that is driving the stock market? Uh, it isn't information about any fluctuation in the present value of dividends that we've ever seen. Uh, maybe it's talking, it's, it's something about something that didn't happen. Uh, there could have been a communist revolution or a nationalization of the stock market. But we can see that in 150 years, nothing, anything remotely like that happened to the stock market. So what's driving it? This, uh, this analysis came out of my MIT PhD dissertation, by the way. But if you go back and read that, you won't find uh, this uh, doubts exposited. I was still in the framework of, of, of then popular economic theory <clears throat> that markets are efficient and are reflecting of information about the future. I think it's pretty clear that they're reflecting something else other than information about future dividends. The same, I also have shown here another plot of the uh, home price index that Carl Case at Wellesley and I developed, the Case Schiller Home Price Index. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, uh, you can see uh, the pattern of home prices uh, and that uh, they have made an enormous jump upward uh, in from 19, I can't get it to, my arrow has stopped working. I'm having a little problem. These are all my fault. Oh, here, I won't do it. I don't know what happened to my arrow. But from 1997, you can see that to 2006, the, stock, the housing market zoomed up. Uh, and then it, it wasn't, well, the economists want to look for something like interest rates or population growth uh, or building costs. None of those did anything over that interval. Uh, so I'm thinking it must have been something like a narrative epidemic. Uh, that's the hypothesis. That, got people into thinking that home prices were a wonderful investment. There were stories about people who made a killing buying and selling or flipping houses. And these narratives encouraged a thought process that uh, was delusional <clears throat> and it ended up badly, as you can see, with a crash in the housing market. Uh, so what's stable? I think the, one of the most stable things about economics should be the tendency for contagion models to work. Uh, the next slide is an example of an epidemic. I picked this. This is from my book. I picked this because Ebola was a famous epidemic. But if I had to do it again, I would not, uh, I'd probably use COVID-19 uh, because that's much more familiar. But this is an epidemic, uh, and you can see uh, the epidemic curve. It's the number of newly reported Ebola cases in one outbreak in Lofa County, Liberia. And you can see the epidemic curve. You can see uh, the, uh, uh, the, the curve rising uh, until week number 10 and then falling. The basic idea is that the rising part occurs because contagion, the contagion rate exceeds the recovery rate. So the number of infected people grow. Eventually, it, the, end, the epidemic ends when the contagion rate falls below the recovery rate. That's the key idea in epi much of ep epidemiology. Um, so uh, you see, here's our President Trump standing in front of another epidemic curve, which was actually an actual and forecasted curve for the co co COVID-19 uh, with Anthony Fau uh, Fauci and Deborah Birx. Uh, familiar now, suddenly familiar. <laughs> uh, and here is, here is an example uh, of a forecast from the uh, IMHE at the University of Washington for the COVID epidemic. These tend to be hump shaped, like we saw above in Ebola. The dashed line is the forecast, and the gray area around it is the confidence interval. So 
So they were, they were quite confident that uh, the that the epidemic would uh, die out at, at when this thing uh, was developed. Uh, I wanted to briefly talk about one epidemic model, which is actually quite uh, uh, popular still in modified form. This is a classic paper by Kermack and McKendrick in 1927, which launched the field of uh, mathematical epidemiology. So it's called a compartmental model. There are three compartments in the population. Susceptibles, these are people who haven't caught the disease. Infectives, I, uh, uh, who, who have caught the disease and are spreading it. And R is the fraction of the population who are recovered and immune. So S plus I plus R equals one, one or 100%. There's two parameters, there's a contagion parameter and a recovery parameter. And it shows all three compartments in a way that the sum of the changes is zero uh, by construction. The middle equation says that the growth in the number of infectives is equal to C times the product of susceptibles and infectives, uh, which is the, the, the new, new cases, minus the recovered, uh, which are a fraction of R of, uh, uh, of, of infectives. Uh, so you can see what happens in that model. Uh, here's a simulation of that model. I picked parameters for C and R, uh, which are, look like plausible parameters for the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, these numbers, by the way, are, can change all the time. It has to do with mitigation efforts and uh, things like that. But in the, in the press, I've seen CNR that look roughly consistent with what I've assumed. Uh, and if there's no more intervention and there's no changes in our uh, mitigation strategy, uh, this is what the Kermack McKendrick model predicts. Uh, when one person in a million had it at time zero, uh, you see a long, slow period. Uh, I wish I could point. Oh, it just doesn't work. Uh, you see a long, slow period when there are, the, the disease is growing exponentially, but from a very small base. Uh, and then it catches public attention. The black hump is the number of uh, percent of the population currently infected. And the orange hump is the number of cases per day uh, that are, that are, are happening. And you can, so that's the model. And so you see the dashed line is, is the ultimate number who are infected uh, uh, and, and recovered. Uh, so I have, we have to add deaths and other things to the model to make it uh, work well. But um, well, one thing you notice is that the number of people who caught the disease is not 100%. It, it stops short of 100%, in this case, 80%. And there's a relation between the, um, the uh, 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 the, 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 there's a relation between the total number infected uh, all, all together, that's I sub infinity, and uh, the parameter ratio C over R called the basic reproduction number. So they were saying that C over R was about 10, about two for COVID-19. Now they're, they're, they're changing that. Uh, so it seems to be a moving target. Uh, but the, what it shows is that the total number of people who get infected uh, depends on the parameters, C and R. If C over R, or the basic reproduction number, is high, uh, then almost everybody will get infected. That, that they'll get over it, and it'll be a memory uh, if for most of them who survive. Well, in the Kermack McKendrick model, they all survive. Uh, so we can't stop this uh, perfectly. We can only change C and R and within limits. Uh, so we, we were what we've been trying to do is flatten the curve. Uh, now the model, the, the Kermack McKendrick model has a simple hump shaped solution uh, for C over R greater than one. Uh, but uh, you also uh, have other variations. Uh, here, this, these are plots from the um, uh, uh, Center for Infectious, Disease, Infectious Diseases Research and Policy at Minnesota. And uh, you can see that, well, the simplest thing is to add seasonality to, uh, to the um, uh, parameter C. Uh, or you can have births, new people coming in, uh, and that can have repeated uh, epidemics. There's lots of variations. Uh, at the CDC uh, in Washington, uh, no, it's, uh, I'm sorry, the Center for Disease Control, 
uh, they have a list of the major forecasting models uh, that uh, are, uh, they, they, they talk about the nature of the model. About half of them are direct descendants from the uh, kermack mckendrick model. Uh, but there's a lot of variations. I'm not gonna get into forecasting diseases, but I wanna show here, just to, to bring us up to date, where we are now in the United States uh, uh, and the European Union. Uh, the European Union uh, looks like a beautiful kermack mckendrick curve, uh, epidemic curve, but the United States uh, is, uh, uh, is changing its contagion rate or changing the C parameter. Uh, and you can see that the decline from the peak uh, of a number of infected uh, cases uh, was uh, less strong than it was in the European Union and has been going up faster uh, now it looks like we're back again for a second wave. All of these things can be accommodated within the basic model uh, that uh, Kermack and McKendrick uh, uh, proposed. With C and R, just choosing them, and that's a simple model, and keeping them constant, you can have both big and small epidemics, and you can have both fast and slow epidemics. You can have epidemics that unfold over weeks and epidemics that unfold over centuries. And so all possibilities, but the basic hump pattern, and maybe with repeats, uh, occurs. Um, so my idea was that economists, uh, these, these curves suggest to me business cycles, <laughs> not necessarily cycles, uh, maybe a misname, but fluctuations in business. And maybe we want something like that to understand these things. So, uh, and we want to apply it to narratives, uh, which are the stories that people really tell, that real people tell. Uh, so I, I want to give you another example of a narrative, which is I consider an economic narrative as well. And that's the story of the brutal killing of uh, uh, George Floyd. Uh, by this, apparently, I don't, don't want to consume, assume him guilty, but by this man uh, uh, in the process of doing that, uh, whatever the outcome of this is, uh, I have to say that that video was extremely effective. There have been a lot of videos about police brutality because policemen have camera, body cameras, but they weren't as effectively filmed as this one. Uh, and somehow this one was really emotion generating and it went viral. It went viral around the whole world, in fact. I thought this would be a US thing, but it's actually everywhere uh, because I think that the contagion rate of this narrative, and it's going to change things in our society. It is already, uh, let's hope for the better. Uh, I'm optimistic, but it might also introduce fears in people that will restrain their spending uh, and affect the economy as well. So this is the basic idea of my book. I just give you some examples of uh, epidemics and then I'll, uh, uh, narrative epidemics. So uh, let's go here to economic models. But the thing about economic models is that they're never as exact as we expect in the physical sciences. They involve a lot of approximation. Uh, so there's never, they're never right or wrong. It's a matter of taste uh, about what kind of model you like. Uh, and maybe new circumstances will come up that will remind people of these models and come again. But we see here, and it's just uh, four famous models uh, of the past. Uh, one of them by uh, MIT professor Paul Samuelson, the overlapping generations model. Uh, uh, oh, also, he did multiplier accelerator model in 1939. You can see that all of these uh, models had their day, and they all had epidemic-like curves. Uh, and it, uh, you know, if you go back and re I recommend all of these models, they're beautiful. <laughs> they're just not fashionable anymore. The human brain has the process of forgetting. It's built into our brain. And unless you're reinforced by more talk, you'll forget it. So here's another example. Uh, uh, this is famous economist. Uh, this, uh, you, you see uh, hump-shaped, they're irregular, but there are hump-shaped patterns in the frequency of mention of these uh, authors. This is from Google Ngrams, which looks at books. Uh, and uh, uh, you, can, you can see uh, that Henry George uh, was really an important economist in the mid 19th century and then on into the 20th. He had a very strong epidemic for a while. 
but he's just faded away. Uh, this is the life course of human thoughts uh, in many cases. Uh, thoughts that might, I, I didn't put Adam Smith on. He was famous in the 1770s, and he's still going uh, pretty strong now in the uh, 20th century. Karl Marx uh, came in and went out. Uh, he, in 1883, when he died, he wasn't very famous. I don't have him on here either. But, uh, and then he didn't peak until the 1970s. You can get that with proper choice of C over R. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about economics and then I'll, I'll stop. Uh, so a lot of, a lot of concern is uh, about uh, financial fluctuations and uh, financial panics. Uh, so I, I looked on um, uh, Google engrams again uh, for the names of various famous financial panic or banking panics. Uh, the Panic of 1837, Panic of 1857, etc. And I think these, these illustrate a constellation of narratives. The basic narrative is the story that uh, people uh, heard a rumor that a bank was about to fail and they panicked because they thought they would lose their money in the bank. So they, they rush and, and pull, uh, form a crowd out the side of the bank. Uh, they, everyone starts talking, uh, and the talk destroys the bank, even if they were a good bank, because they can't handle everybody at once. This is like what we saw with toilet paper. It wasn't a banking panic, it was toilet paper panic during the COVID-19 epidemic. These have to have economic consequences. But the interesting thing about these uh, panics, uh, uh, epidemic curves, is that they are, uh, they are, um, uh, there's, a, there's a group component to them. If you look at 1837, I can't point, it's still not working. Uh, you see nothing is happening in 1837. During that panic year, they didn't call it the panic of 1837. Uh, they didn't call it, there was a stock market decline too. They didn't call it a stock market crash. The story was different. It was a story about Andrew Jackson and the Bank of the United States and over lending on agricultural uh, land. And uh, it was just a different story. But a, a story developed about all these panics. And the reason we had more and more panics was because you, you can't have a banking panic if people have never heard of banking panics. They won't, they won't react to the story. Uh, they have to have uh, memories of that story. And this also ultimately ended in after the panic of 1907 with the founding of the Federal Reserve uh, in, in, in 1913. But I think that to me, this is a narrative, fundamentally a narrative story. We don't talk about banking panics very much anymore. In 20, 2009, when the Fed saw the failure of some banks, they immediately took a, extremely aggressive uh, measures under Bernanke uh, because they, they thought that uh, realistically, we don't want to get back to that old narrative. And while uh, Bernanke doesn't talk narrative economics, he's an intuitive narrative economist because he has studied history uh, and that led him to do some aggressive things to stop it. Uh, and finally, I just want to look at the Great Depression narrative uh, as an example. The, the Great Depression, uh, from 1929 to 1939, essentially, it was a decade-long, uh, a decade-long period uh, of uh, uh, underemployment. Uh, the unemployment rate got up to 25 uh, percent, and uh, after a stock market crash, that narrative is interesting. It wasn't around in 1929. <laughs> it wasn't particularly big in the Great Depression, but it started to grow later. In both books, this has both books and newspaper articles. But the books stopped in 2008 because that's where my data stopped. But you can see news in newspapers that the, the, uh, the heavy line, the talk of the Great Depression went up almost fivefold in 2008, 2009. Uh, and uh, it uh, becomes a model for what happens. It can be a self fulfilling prophecy. People thought they saw something similar. And that brought out a new version of, this, of the old story. Again, this is from my book. I didn't have COVID-19. Uh, but uh, the Great Depression stories are starting to come up again. 
Uh, they're not as strong. Uh, I don't know why, uh, but I'm worried that they could get stronger. Uh, and then the uh, and then the uh, economic problems that we've seen already would become amplified. Uh, anyway, the end of my book is a call for research on narrative economics. We have tons of tons and tons of data that we can analyze. We need to think differently than conventionally about uh, macroeconomics. I'll stop with that. Thank you so much, Professor Schiller. I have a few questions myself, but um, a reminder to the alumni viewers to ask questions of your guests today um, using the Q&A feature on Zoom, where you can also upvote questions you like to hear discussed. Um, put in your questions. I'm, I'm sure you have lots of questions for Professor Schiller, and um, we'll get to them in a second. What, um, first, let me say, Professor Schiller, I loved your book. Um, as a journalist, I love stories and narratives. And I really was struck by how you describe the importance of narratives. Whether they're true or not, I think, as you argue in your book, they still can have a huge impact. So I guess my first question is, what is the narrative you see emerging today about the economy and COVID? Um, do you see a, a sort of prevailing narrative emerging out of today's event, out of the pandemic? Uh, yeah, well, I, at the present time, I see uh, two things happening. Emerging narratives, which is a good question to ask about, but also fading narratives. The new narrative crowds out the old narrative. So for example, we had this global warming narrative, uh, which was very, very vivid and talked about uh, with you know, photographs of dying seals in the Antarctic and things like that. Uh, but it's taking a temporary vacation, I think. It just <laughs> got crowded out. Uh, we, we are also cr somewhat crowding out the Trump narrative. Uh, but he, he has such a strong power of generating narratives that he's kind of uh, mated with COVID-19. <laughs> And now the two are talked about together an awful lot. Uh, so as far as COVID-19, one thing is comparisons with the Great Depression. They compare the unemployment rate, but they don't see a lot of similarities. They, they talk about the, uh, the influenza epidemic of 1918 as a comparison, uh, but that's not too loud and strong. It's an, there's a lot of interesting stories that can come out of the 1918 experience. Uh, for example, that they thought that the whole 1918 uh, influenza epidemic was caused by the Germans as a last ditch effort to uh, win the war, the World War I. Uh, but the, the, there was a recession in 1918, uh, but it wasn't very big or dramatic. So I'm still, it doesn't provide a good uh, example. Um, but I think that there are other things that are developing that we've never heard of before that are new narratives that have an economic impact. Uh, one of them is the, uh, uh, the, the story about uh, second or third waves. Uh, as happened in 1918, there were three main waves of that. that, that. So it looks like today, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the, the recent news is looking like we're here for a second wave. Uh, and it's hard to stop it now because it's so far along. Uh, it's expensive to do contact tracing and uh, 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 testing. So uh, on, on such a large population, uh, we have to try to do that, I suppose. But the, the, so there's a there was a it, beginning of a narrative of fear of actually something more like the Great Depression, which worries me about the uh, about about the future. Um, and uh, also social distancing. Uh, I, I, some people seem to think that we're going to want to do this forever. Uh, and that's going to change everything, including, for example, our universities. Uh, uh, the universities may be in trouble uh, because uh, people really like the social atmosphere. And th that might be a stronger uh, attraction than we realize. But they don't want that anymore because of contagion. Uh, so there's a thought, a scary thought, uh, and it, it could be applied more widely to all kinds of businesses. Maybe the business isn't viable anymore because people don't want to come in. 
Uh, so these are the, I mean, you know all pretty well what the narratives are today. <laughs> There's a lot of them. Right. Uh, but uh, both fading narratives and, and growing narratives, both sides of the epidemic curve. Um, right. And so I, I'd still think of this as a risky time because a, a time of change of fundamental narratives underlying our economic behavior uh, might involve some big swings in asset prices or uh, uh, or economic activity. Right. That's so interesting. Again, what one of the things that's really interesting to me is your argument, whether the narrative is true or not, or supported by facts or information or not, they still can have a huge economic impact. Right. That's an important issue now with uh, fake news yeah. stories. Uh, both sides accuse the other of lying. Uh, and... Uh, when everybody's lying, it's hard to do business, uh, or, or nobody trusts anybody. That's that's bad. Right. I want to get to the Q and A from our listeners, um, and um, let me kind of make sure I understand the question. So I'm going to read a bit, not the whole question, but just to make sure I get it right. And there's one question from Doug. It says, "One story that persists among academic economists, despite all evidence." is that government spending adds to growth. And I think he's, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and he says the negative relationship of government spending with investment and growth holds for all advanced economies and among advanced ec um, economies. Um, why isn't this more recognized? I guess, first, do you agree, <clears throat> agree with that? And why is it not more recognized? Uh, actually, I don't know the study. Maybe you could uh, let us have to have to read. But if you look at all, you're looking at all countries, including emerging countries. Uh, it could be that there's a problem of corruption in some countries where the government spending is siphoning off, uh, siphoning off resources. If that if that is uh, uh, is is really uh, true. It, it seems to me that uh, there that it isn't really disputable that there is a role for government spending. Uh, it was called the American system uh, by Henry Clay in the early 19th century. What is the American system? It's government involvement in infrastructure, like building the Erie Canal or something like that. Uh, and so that was thought to be the uh, essential uh, ele element of the American success, at least by him and by others who followed him. Uh, so. I, th I, th I think I am a general believer in uh, capitalism, that most of our activities should be in the private sector. Uh, but there is a natural uh, uh, argument for some things, uh, like global warming, for example. Uh, the private sector has a problem curing that. We need someone who can lay down the law and uh, control emissions, uh, which is inherently government uh, activity. Right. Here's a really interesting question, I think, from Amy Yermish. How can we use this idea of narrative to help more effectively spread pro-social narratives, you know, beneficial narratives like wear a mask, stay at home, to, yeah. combat, to combat disinformation narratives? Or is there a is there a way we can sort of promote the sort of the positive narrative right uh, so i think uh that idea uh has had its history uh and i think that um uh, in the united states and i'm sure for the world uh the last couple of centuries have been a period of, of progress in understanding of human psychology i mentioned the talk of panics uh in financial markets that was an extension of psychology uh and uh, there was a, a theory that you, you had to be careful what you said uh, to avoid creating panics. The idea you shouldn't shout fire in a crowded theater. Uh, I found that from uh, 1880s, I think. It was a popular uh, story uh, that they can cause uh, danger. Uh, and it led to uh, 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 public figures who didn't want to disrupt the state of confidence. Confidence became important. 
uh, in the 19th century. The idea that if people are, won't, won't spend if they don't have uh, belief in the integrity of the system. Uh, but that led to errors that were also made. So for example, Calvin Coolidge, who from 1923 to 1929 was our president of the United States, uh, he was uh, uh, very pro-business. Uh, and uh, when, when asked about movements in the stock market, he would always be bullish. And someone pointed this out in the 1920s. Uh, does he know what he's talking about? <laughs> he's always <laughs> bullish. Uh, and uh, uh, he eventually became discredited. In fact, laughing stock for having constantly, after he was president, during the Great Depression, keep saying that it's about to end now, it's about to end now, and it didn't. So it's not easy at all to know what you say to boost people's morale. And it's very important. It takes a certain kind of human talent uh, it, uh, that some people uh, have called emotional intelligence. Uh, you have to understand the mindset of people and maintain basic honesty. Uh, so people think uh, Franklin Roosevelt was very good at that with his fireside chats. Um, but uh, maybe he uh, uh, wasn't good enough to stop the depression. So we have other examples of trying to spread enlightened ideas like the voice of America. Uh, maybe it did have a positive effect, uh, but the question is how to keep it on the, on the enlightened path. Uh, and we worry about its future. Uh, it may end up being a propaganda machine. Uh, so I don't have an easy answer to this. I think we have, we have schools of journalism, we have schools of public policy, uh, and there are, things one can learn, uh, but I also it takes uh, mature and seasoned judgment. That's why we want to have as our national leaders, someone who has those emotionally intelligent skills and a breadth of knowledge that allows them to frame narratives that uh, really work. But they have to be stories too. They have to be something tellable to go viral. Someone has to have a, a gift of um, writing or of speaking skills that makes them, uh, uh, makes, them makes them effective in creating epidemics of positive epidemics. Well, that's so, so interesting. I think also maybe the more we understand the nature of narratives and, and sort of their power kind of helps us to, to, to understand um, the force, the power of these narratives. Um, we have a couple more Q and A's, but I, I was at, um, interesting in a quick question on how do you think social media is changing the nature of narratives? I mean, we live in a world shaped by, you know, social media. Right. Um, how does that affect what you're, what you're thinking about? Uh, that, that sounds to me like a good dissertation topic. A <laughs> hundred dissertations. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, but uh, one thing that comes to mind that the social media allow you to travel. Uh, and, you know, I expect some of our listeners today are not even in the United States, right? I mean, you've got them all over the, maybe I'm being uh, optimistic, but I think likely you do. Uh, every time I get on to some Zoom thing, I find people that are from all over. So it, it's a uniting force of a sort. It allows people of a certain frame of mind to find others like them. Uh, they may be people who are delusional, and they can find each other, find other people with the same delusion. Uh, and then uh, who knows what the effects of that are. Uh, so it, it also is faster, uh, faster than uh, the old word of mouth and less geographical. It, may, it, it can go from, uh, from Boston to London to any, <laughs> any Timbuktu in a matter of seconds right. or even milliseconds, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, uh, so that's another factor to consider. But on the other hand, I also emphasize that things did go viral, even in ancient times, uh, mm -hmm. because word of mouth, it, it, it isn't going to go in seconds, but it can go in uh, days uh, if it's a good enough narrative. It, it can really explode, even in the uh, early ancient times. Right. A few more questions. Uh, one viewer wants to know, do deficits matter anymore? They don't seem to matter now, but what happens if they sudden, suddenly matter 
in the future? I think we're all worried about all this spending right. going on. Well, I think this is a, uh, uh, the narrative has a name. It's modern monetary theory. Uh, <laughs> and that, uh, uh, that narrative is most uh, uh, expressed by Stephanie Kelton at Stony Brook. Uh, but there are others who are on that. Uh, to me, it sounds like uh, uh, it's, it does have an element of truth to it that uh, we've been able to borrow money lately without causing inflation. Uh, and it's probably a good thing to do at the present time to ease us, uh, the government borrowing money, or, or I suppose individuals borrowing money too <laughs> for the time being, to smooth out the, uh, uh, the effects of the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, that's not entirely a new idea though, because that's what John Maynard Keynes became famous for during the 1930s. Uh, so there is a there is a room for deficit spending, uh, but if but eventually uh, it's going to have an impact that may not work out well. The people who are owning government debt expect to be paid, uh, and so uh, how is the government going to get? If the government was spending the money wisely on infrastructure, say in such a way that it boosts the economy, then they'll have the money. But if suppose they spend it unwisely, uh, then uh, it's going to cause dislocation eventually. The interest on the debt will get so high uh, if they go too far that they'll have to tax other people who didn't buy government bonds uh, rather strictly in order to pay off those who did. Uh, and that, that can be a, uh, a socially divisive moment. Uh, and uh, I don't think it's a good idea to let it go too far. So there is a limit to how much the government should borrow. Uh, and uh, uh, it depends on the, on the, limit, on the number of, con, uh, of investments that the government can make uh, and how, how important they are in the long run. Uh, so again, it's, it's not a simple yes or no thing. Interesting, interesting. Another question from Tyler McBroom. I think it's the one that lots of us wonder about. At any given moment, he, he asked, I imagine there are many stories of circulating in the economy and among investors. Some are bullish and some are bearish. So how, how, should, it, how should one think about multiple stories interacting? I guess it gets at, how, how do you know when a narrative is true or not, or, or, or <laughs> accurate or not? And in particular in the, in the markets. Uh, it's, uh, it's a big project. We've, we've seen uh, economic forecasters and economics departments uh, for the better part of a century trying to figure these things out. And it's not easy because they don't succeed in predicting very well. Uh, recent studies at the IMF show that uh, economists, uh, if you take the whole bulk of those who are professional forecasters, they, they have a definite ability to forecast out or one or two or maybe three quarters. But when you reach a in limit of a year, uh, it's very, uh, they're very ineffective. Uh, it seems that things are generated that don't, uh, uh, that don't get recorded in their models uh, and are not statistically analyzed. Uh, so what I would like to do is form a better uh, scholarly tradition of dealing with uh, changing narratives we have to consider it a, uh, an important uh, uh, effort to get the time series of information uh, and tie those into macroeconomic models. Uh, and that's a big project. I mean, as an individual, we're, we're kind of left with our intuition. Uh, and I think that uh, some people who are, uh, have a better emotional intelligence, who've done better studies of history can see uh, 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 some patterns that might already be visible. Uh, but uh, the problem is that uh, these narratives are often self-fulfilling prophecies. They generate their own uh, success. Uh, and so it, uh, the, the, the narratives seem, uh, maybe that's what uh, Tyler's uh, question was, was about, that they seem insubstantial. Uh, and uh, they're often very hard to definitively disprove. That's why we have all of these conspiracy theories and uh, uh, who knows, you know, they, you can't be absolutely 
sure that they're wrong, typically. They just sound funny uh, to, to us. Uh, and, uh, and maybe we overlook uh, some conspiracies. There's no simple formula. I, I think that part of it is to get a good education <laughs> and remember uh, history and remember uh, uh, the things you learned in sociology and psychology and the like, uh, as well as economics. Uh, and I think uh, it, it's, a, it's such a human phenomenon that we can't be perfect in, uh, uh, in analyzing it. Right. To know which stories to believe. Um, what one viewer wants to know or ask, if epidemics and narrative contagion rates are critical to, predict to prediction, what factors determine the contagion rate of a narrative? Um, yes, uh, that's an important question. And it's a question that people in literature departments <laughs> are trying to figure out. What is it about some novel that uh, people love and remember over centuries? Uh, what is it about it? Uh, and they try to teach people good writing. Uh, but uh, there, are, there are people who've done computer analysis of books trying to identify what is, uh, uh, what is the success story of books. Uh, or songs or mu music. What is it about good music? How could you identify a classic from, from a... Uh, not very interesting. How could you get a computer to do that? Uh, it's hard. It's hard to. Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, uh, but I think there is something. I, my book has been interpreted as supporting humanities fields, uh, and uh, I, I guess I, I am in that camp. Uh, but I think there's there's so many different perspectives that can be put on narrative by people with different uh, knowledge set, and I'm I. I know it, one reason why economists don't like to study narratives is that it's just ambiguous, that narratives have so many details about what, what part of it is important or not. Uh, it seems like some of the details that make a narrative contagious are the use of visual symbols. Uh, uh, in my book, I point out that uh, the Roman senator Cicero in his book on rhetoric uh, says, put visual symbols into your speeches because people remember those better. It's also a connection to uh, celebrities uh, or a connection to patriotism uh, and uh, also uh, somehow a connection to principles that people identify with. Uh, you know, the uh, people have different identities. They often buy products that support their identity as a certain kind of person. And so marketing departments are, will tell you about that and how to uh, market effectively. If you look at marketing uh, on television commercials, they're all stories. You never have a scientist get up and describe how we develop this new medicine. <laughs> we don't care about the scientists. They'll show someone at the backyard, leaning over the backyard fence saying, it helped me. Uh, so people want to put it in a human interest story. That's what they teach you in journalism schools. And so and you have to see through these uh, devices and try to get at what is the factual basis uh, of, this, uh, of this particular narrative. Uh, and uh, some people develop a reputation for doing that well. Often our newspapers, some of our major newspapers are considered, have been considered as reliable uh, as researchers of uh, the truth of stories. But that's being somewhat uh, broken down now with this idea that the mainstream media might be uh, lying to us. Uh, so it's, it's part of the human story, uh, trying to figure out when people talk, whether they're being honest or not. Mm -hmm. And it's not uh, something that, uh, that I can mathematize or program a computer to do at this point in history. Right. Right. Interesting. Bates McKee wants to, is asked, since we successfully, so successfully, apparently, survived the Great Recession, does that recent memory desensitize us to the likelihood of a new recession today? I, I think that's important for understanding the booming stock market. The stock market uh, uh, bottomed out in 2009, and it, it reached uh, its all-time record high uh, on February 19th of this year. Uh, and 
that was uh, uh, a, that was because I think of the, of a narrative that 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 we remember clearly from 2009. At least those of us who were adults in 2009, uh, that some people got out of the stock market in 2009. I know for a fact that people were worried that the market would crash much further than it did. And this, I think, was part of the Great Depression narrative, which, which came again. So the V-shaped recovery that we saw in 2009 uh, uh, with such a dramatic uh, recovery uh, is on everyone's mind. It's a narrative that you don't want to miss out on this opportunity. Uh, you don't want to wait until the market is really low to invest in it because they, they may never get there. Uh, and uh, so you hear a lot about V-shaped recoveries nowadays. That's part of the narrative uh, of, uh, of the uh, last recovery. Uh, so, but it's not just that. There's also narratives about the stock market crash, uh, not the, 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 uh, the correction in the stock market at the beginning of 2018. And another one uh, at the end of 2018 that uh, it almost went down 20%. Uh, and so many people thought that this bull market that followed the, uh, 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 the, the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, 2009, uh, that uh, what was, uh, could happen again. And uh, uh, it, uh, it, it left us looking at recent stories uh, uh, like those that I mentioned, as, uh, as stories that uh, are a model for what might happen now. Instead of more remote stories, you don't hear people talking about the Panic of 1837 mm -hmm. very much. You know, it might be relevant. Right. That's interesting. One final question. This is the last question, but I think it's one that we all been hearing and thinking a lot about. Um, Jeff Friedman, asks, one of the hot topic discussion points about COVID-19 and the lockdown is the economic cost of shutting down versus the cost of disease burden and death without intervention. You know, as an economist, what is your perspective? Is this a trade-off? Um, what do you think about this emerging narrative that there is somehow a trade-off? Yeah, yeah, well, uh, this goes, reminds me of a literature that was very popular, how many years ago, maybe 50, 40 years ago, about the, the value of a human life. And economists were pointing out that people will uh, spend very irregularly to save lives. So for example, if a small three-year-old child falls into a well uh, and is crying for help, we'll bring the whole fire department out and they'll, they'll spend a million dollars to get the child out just because of the story, the, 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 uh, uh, the human interest story. But what about putting up signs on, uh, on highways warning of certain uh, possible dangers? That might be money better spent if we value a human life at a million dollars. So uh, economists were arguing, uh, this maybe gave us a bad reputation. We should, put a, we should put a price on the human life. So when that three-year-old falls into the well, and they call the fire department. The fire department says, no, I'm sorry, we won't come out. It, it, it costs more than the threshold that we, we've had. So we just let them die down there. Uh, uh, there is a trade-off, of course, but it's filled with emotions. Uh, and uh, uh, we have to, uh, uh, people have some sense of, uh, of humanity and uh, fairness that, uh, that, that has, limited the impact of this economic narrative about the value of the human life. Right. I think that's all we have time. I, I would like to, if any of the viewers or listeners have not read your book, please, they should. It's, it's, it really is, to, to me, was a, a fascinating book, but also one that really helped me understand sort of all the, the debates going on and, and understand by putting them in the context of a narrative really made sense to me. So on behalf of the Alumni Association, thanks for tuning into this faculty forum online. And thanks to Professor Robert Schiller 
for joining us today. Alumni will be sure to forward all questions asked via the Q&A to our speaker today. And the alumni office staff will keep the chat window open for networking purposes for another 15 minutes or so. A reminder that this broadcast will be available on the MIT Alumni Association YouTube channel with, within a week of today. So thanks again, Professor Schiller, and thanks everyone for watching. Thanks so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.